so hi thank you all for being here um uh this is this is the book midnight self uh i'm gonna read from the title story um it seems appropriate because this was actually um this is actually the oldest story in the book i hope it doesn't show uh that it's the oldest story but uh it's also the title story so i figured it was appropriate still too dark thanks mom um uh, not, not much i can do about that um at any rate um just going to read from the first uh 10 pages of or so of the story and um hope you all enjoy and this is obviously that all my stories are spooky to some degree so this will i mean this will be no surprise to anybody who knows my writing but also because it's you know october what's the date i have no idea october 25th um i figured that it would be appropriate uh the story is called midnight self and I'm going to read from the beginning. So there's really, I guess there's no need for explanation beyond just the beginning. Mara wakes at 3 a.m. from a series of plodding and linear dreams to the voice of a woman, not herself, speaking over the snow of her son Theo's monitor. It says, Ew, ew, esp oit is cert. The receiver lights up like a whippoorwill's eyes, casting red haze on her husband Paul's cheek. She reaches for him, draws up short. The voice, it is surely a woman, speaks on. Gree er budu miang kre wusu hai get reams. The monitor is analog. It is smelted together from shells of hard plastic. It has dials, LED, and a frequency band designed to squeeze out interference. Paul, too, is waking. He's powering on. Again, Mara thinks. It is happening again. You're round, Paul sort of shouts at her. No rounds, she is already half out of the room. There's someone, a stranger in Theo's room, Paul. There are no fucking rounds, she says. Why didn't you say that? But Myra is gone. The dim parallax of the howl is before her. It narrows, then roams with peripheral fuzz, jutters as she starts in running. She has not yet arrived in her son Theo's room, but nor has she taken the monitor with her, and she moves in a cognitive dead space, a void, where an impotent panic begins to sit in. She passes the pictures like dim portals shining, goes under the rope pole that opens the attic, turns left at the dark at the top of the stairs, across whose width a baby gate is dividing the landing below into channels. At Theo's door, she turns around to see her husband lurching toward her, one of his hands pushing into his eyes, the other one feeling the plaster for balance. She takes in a breath like a breath during labor, an organizing breath, she thinks, and she levers the door handle down, the door in. It reveals her baby's bedroom like a slow wipe in a film. The toys, the box-assembled crib, the nautical theme the mo of the mobile revolving. At first there is darkness above Theo's crib, a bank of darkness hovering there in which nothing of him or his life can be seen. But then she hits the bedroom lights and the depth of it comes into view with him in it. Instantly, her son starts crying, face disintegrating in something like umbrage, and instantly, instinctively, she scans for the rash that only several months before had threatened with fever his tender, brief life. First his elbows, then his knees, before moving on to his knuckles and eyes, and diminishing finally in muscle fatigue that left him weaker, more exposed, a runt of immunity, bare on a mountain. The illness is called JDM. Juvenile derma something something, a name that Myra can't pronounce. Since Theo arrived home from children's last week, tonight is their first with a monitor on. Myra has crashed in his room like a drunk the last seven nights. Myra goes forward. Hey, Theo. Hey, you. It's Theo's witching hour. That's right. That's right, my little guy. He wails. He's just learned to crawl and is doing it now, sluggishly from one end of his crib to the other. She senses Paul behind her, stumbling closet she says to him huh check the closet while paul does this she reaches down scoops theo up not by the arms of the armpits but always the baby books tell her the sides then holding him into her night breasts a moment just long enough to promise something she rotates him into a perch on her forearm while nuzzling the hair on his little clay head hungry or cranky or both both huh i'm hankery mom get with it there's nothing, says Paul. The crib, she says. There are blankets, he says. Underneath it, the floor. Paul, okay, okay, he says. I've got him here. Okay, he says. He squats and huffs and pokes his head. Then he wiggles his ass and emerges once more. 
Like I said, the floor, he says. He rises and bows in a satire of gallantry. His pajamas are paint are printed with a grinning cartoon monkey. A woman's voice, I swear, she says. The baby's screaming in her ear. A woman saying, what, says Paul. Even though Theo can't speak human yet, Mara gestures at her husband. A cross between hang loose and off with his head. Mara doesn't want Theo to hear Paul say woman, but she just said woman. Their fight makes no sense. Well, I can't do anything right, can I, Mara? This is not about you, Paul. Paul answers exactly as Theo's pitch changes, ratcheting into skill saw mode. So Mara strikes out for the old rocking chair donated by some family member. The pattern she's rubbing in Theo's tense back, growing tighter and tighter the nearer she draws. My little demented baby man, inconsolable woes he must suffer, says Moira. She sits in the chair now, which faces the window, which frames the semi-urban street and starts to rock Theo while freeing a nipple, remembering the, the woman's voice. Daddy's a martyr, but daddy's all right, isn't he, Mr. Psycho Ward? We love daddy for who he is. Her milk lets down. She takes a breath. Her head is clearer in these moments before the feeding fog sets in and she feels, call her cheesy, whatever, she feels it, that the scales of the cosmos have tipped in her favor. Her husband stands there at her side, massaging her neck as she breastfeeds their son. Couldn't get back to sleep last night, so I did a little research, says Paul, over breakfast. What did you find, Mara says, pecking yogurt, surprised to hear she still knows words after so little sleep in her infant son's room. Mara's mind is dull with worry, or maybe fuzzy is the word, with worry and feeding her 18-month-old more often and longer than probably she should. Indeed, some days the feeling is so heavy on her, she feels she can't go one more step, as though she is two people, both Mara's, both tired, one of whom sleeps at the drop of a hat, while the other is vaguely concerned for this person, uncouth narcoleptic who wanders the house. Theo is with her even now, ensconced in her underneck clavicle region like she's some sort of beanbag chair, which makes it hard to eat her yogurt. Calmly and reasonably spooning in puffins, her husband sits across the table. Saleswoman told us, remember, says Paul, trying to move the better model. So the monitor's to blame, says Mara. The monitor, yeah, Paul explains, and the trotters, you know, the trotters, three doors down. Christiane Trotter, she says, nodding vaguely, rolling her neighbor's name inside her mouth. It's like in that movie, The Guys in the Train. What is it that they say? Crisscross. The monitor frequencies cross, says Paul, while knitting the air above his toast. And she hears you with Theo here, and you hear her out there with... Paul briskly snaps his fingers at her, summoning the baby's name. Gina, Myra answers for him, and Paul settles back, satisfied with himself, while Theo headbutts Myra's chin. Last week when they'd purchased the new baby monitor, Paul had wanted to get the better model, but Myra had opted for the cheap one, perhaps not wanting to acknowledge that they needed to keep such a close eye on Theo after only just starting to loosen their watch. Oh, says Myra. Oh, she says, but in her mind, she says, perhaps. Is it strange Paul has referenced a film about murder, Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train, to clear up what happened with Mara last night? He might have opted for a rom-com, a meet-cute where two single parents cross signals, end up in each other's lives. But no, Paul has referenced a film about murder, where men not overfond of women decide to swap murders to look less suspicious, the exact sort of narrative Paul shouldn't mention, A, after last night, and B, to his own wife, though this isn't exactly atypical of him. He doesn't always read the room. He likes to explain certain concepts directly and certain metaphors are best. The work that Paul does have to do with computers. He has something to do with refurbishing code or something to do with protecting its function, or in any case, something her mind never grips for long enough to see it whole, and not because Myra does not understand it. To hear the things Paul does all day is like watching mute frames in a used car commercial, with the mind slipping off, glomming on, always slipping. He'd been elegant in explaining it once on a night in the year just before they were married, having takeout and wine in their living room floor, elaborating how computers, these things that they used, these things that they depended on, operated like obsessive compulsives at home. 
Such a person, Paul said, if set down in a room, let's say to find a hair curler, would hunt among the objects there, making keen algorithmic assessments of each to determine if each of them wasn't the curler, but of course at these massive accelerant rates that far outstrip the human mind. To demonstrate for her, Paul had put down his wine glass, pretended to lose it, then find it again. Mara had liked the efficiency of it, the poetic efficiency. Sure, why not? It was nothing to do with computers themselves. It had been Paul's description of them. Now, too efficient, Paul tells her, you've got this. This is nothing compared to, Paul trails off. She can tell he doesn't want to say it, the name of Theo's prolonged illness that has only just settled their whole life scorched by it. We've got this together, Paul tells her, just us. He says it with bluster and sweetly, he is. Paul comes to stand above her chair, takes the bowl and the spoon from her hands, sets them down. Then he wraps his arms tightly around her and Theo, who's fooling around in Mara's hair. At first, it's a little too tight. Mara squirms. Then it starts to feel okay. Later that morning with Theo conked out, Mara has households that she should be doing. The laundry, the dishes, the food-crusted tiles, emailing her sister, grand tragic in love speaking to the neighbor woman with the monitor signal that crosses with hers, trying to get to the bottom of that which still carrion pecks at her mind with unease. It isn't that Paul's explanation is, is thin. What her husband Paul said makes exorbitant sense. Too much goddamn sense, thinks Myra. And ever since Theo's unspeakable illness, she's turned her mind on sense as such. So she wants something, mainly, to sharpen her mind so Moira can cut to the core of the mystery lying under the one Paul has already solved. It's a capable mind, she knows, believes, just a little fuzzy lately. She needs something to sort of jar it, so she sits down in front of the monitor's speakers, scans through the dial for some good, solid static, and scribbles freehand with the sound in her ears remembering the woman's voice. This is not a dream journal. It wasn't a dream. It's not strictly new book, a record either. Automatic, the words just come up in her writing. What the spiritualist mediums used to do to contact those beyond the veil, but mostly it will be a story, the story of the woman's voice. Yet all that comes to minds are scenes, or cuts rather from scenes from films, but divorced from their titles, their narrative structures. The films are shrill runs, midnight, midnight chillers. In them, people mostly die. Yet they'd been Mara's happy place throughout the long pre-dawn torpors of Theo's first feedings, or in the months after when he'd gotten sick, when he had lain there, lolling, weak, his skin a hash of flaking redness. The juvenile derma something something could be combated several ways. Vitamin supplements, antibiotics, topical ointments with Byzantine labels. But the very best way they had told her was her, the rest and the healing she brought with her milk. And so just when she thought she'd be freer of nursing, she found her, herself back in the stranglehold of it. The sprawling and listing, the hourly engorgements, the back pain and nipple chafe making her wild. She'd watch the movies on her laptop with Theo strapped suckling over her middle, jump cuts from the screen flashing onto his cheek. A lot of the doctors and books said no screen time, even indirect screen time before they turned two, but Mara kept the volume down, the computer itself balanced over her knees. She would sit through the movies, absorbing them almost, their creeping ambiance, their death, their gloom and their agony humming in her. They would sucker her soul as she suckered her son. She would say to Paul, guess what I watched with the baby? And Paul would say, don't, before catching himself. And then he would say, watch whatever you want. Thanks.